Amen. So the word that the Lord dropped in my heart for tonight is from Isaiah chapter 50, verse 4, and I just took a little piece of it. Um, if you see it on, on, the, on the cover that, and on the post that we put up on our Facebook page, it's from Isaiah verse, uh, chapter 50, verse 4, just a piece of that verse, but it says, he awakens my ear to listen. So can you say that? Wakens my ear to listen. Because that's a prayer that all of us should be able to say as a promise from God. He awakens my ear to listen. You don't want to live in a time when you're not hearing from the Lord, right? Especially now. So many difficult decisions to make and, and not knowing exactly how we're supposed to live our lives. <clears throat> We've never, most of us in our lifetimes, have never been in this kind of warlike situation before in isolation. But then it goes on to say, to sustain the weary with a word. So how about saying that with me too? To sustain the weary with a word. So he awakens my ear to listen for a purpose so I can sustain the weary with a word. And that's what the prophetic does. When you know there's an open heaven over your life and you're hearing from the Lord, he allows you to minister to other people. And that's a big part of why we're here. We represent him. We're the body of Christ in the earth. And there's a lot of weary people right now. Weary over finances, weary over people they've lost in their families or in their broader connections. And we just want to say a prayer, just a blanket prayer right now. Lord, we just thank you that your peace passes all understanding. That for those that are struggling and have a hard time, we just ask you to bring that comfort that you talk about so often in your word. It's not in, able to be comprehended in the natural, but it's a supernatural gift of comfort that you bring. But we also speak peace over the storm in people's lives. And we pray this word would be true for us, that you awaken our ears to listen so that we can sustain the weary with a word. When other people are hurting, you want to give us a word to encourage them, Lord. We ask for that Barnabas anointing to be able to encourage people that are hurting as you did. So I just want to read the, the more extended part of that, which uh, is verse 4, 5, and then 7 from um, Isaiah 50 and a couple of different versions. I already said the first part. He wakes me up in the morning and opens my ears to listen as one ready to take orders. That's the message Bible. And I like that because it's got a military feel to it. But it's also, if you played any kind of sports, you know that on offense, you have to take your orders and you're going to go out and you're going to try to score or whatever it is. In football, you want to score a touchdown, right? So you have an open ear and you're waiting to receive the orders from the commander in chief or the coach or who's ever given you the strategy. Then it says, God has given me the tongue of discipleship. So he puts his word in my mouth so that I can speak it as one of his disciples to sustain the weary with the word. But I like, again, what it says in the message, I didn't go back to sleep. <laughs> so when he woke me up in the morning, I didn't go back to sleep. I didn't pull the covers back over my head. And from what I've been talking to people about and hearing is that that can happen to people. They, they've broken their routine and they don't feel that need to get up in the morning. And I would tell you, that's not a good idea. You should try to keep your routine. You should try to stay disciplined, take a shower, get dressed, shave, and, and stay active and stay connected with the word. And if you're not able to work right now, there's plenty of people that need help that you could be talking to. So don't go back to sleep and don't pull the covers back over your head. And then verse 7, this is the Passion Translation, says, Yahweh empowers me with holy determination. I know I'm asking a lot, but say that with me, all right? Yahweh empowers me with holy determination. That's how we're supposed to live our lives. We're supposed to feel that we have that mission that he has put us on, and I'm not going to turn back over in the morning. I'm anxious to wake up and hear what he has to say and to receive my orders, like it says back up in verse 4. And then it says, I will do his will and not be ashamed. And that's our confession, that we want to do the perfect will of God every minute of every day that we're alive. So maybe you've put two and two together, but Isaiah 50 has also been called an Old Testament version of the Lord's Prayer because you'll see when we read it in the more traditional versions that you've probably heard these verses before. Verse 5, the Lord has opened my ear and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. Verse 6, I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who plucked out my beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. 
for the Lord God will help me. Therefore, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. Who might that be? What's the prophetic picture in the Old Testament? That's Jesus. That's Jesus going to the cross. So this is the mission that Jesus had when he was here. He knew that he was going to have to take on a difficult task, but he was obedient to the Father. He knew what his mission was. A big part of that mission was to reverse the curse of sin that came into the garden. When sin came in the world, the formula came about that the wages of sin would be death. But the gift of God is what? Eternal life through Christ. So he was coming on a mission to reverse the curse of disobedience by being obedient. The blessing comes in obedience. Read Deut Deuteronomy chapter 28. There's blessings and curses. If you're obedient, you get blessed. If you're disobedient, there's a curse on that. And Jesus is saying, I'm willing to accept my orders. But that allows us to put our name in here and say, I want to do the same thing, Lord. I want to be willing to suffer persecution on your behalf. It's not easy to live as a Christian in this world because people who are living in sin don't want to hear what you have to say because you're bringing some form of righteousness in and that feels like shackles to them. It feels like you're telling them that you want to take their fun away. But we've come to the realization that God loves people and it's not shackles that he gives us. He just puts boundaries on our lives so that we can be abundant in the way we live, not reckless and careless. So you can look back through the Old Testament and there are seasons when the prophetic word was very rich, like Trisha already quoted, when Elijah was, uh, when Elijah's mantle was active, there were miracles happening on a regular basis. His apprentice, Elisha, said, I want you to give me a double portion of your mantle before you go. And that happened as well, right? Because he saw Elijah as he was being taken away. There were miracles after miracles happening as you read that portion of scripture. But then there's other times when disobedience was rampant in the kingdom that the word of God became much more sparse. Yeah. And we need to press in and continue actively seeking the voice of the Lord in our lives. He loves us, but we have a part to do in being obedient to listen to what he's saying and seeking that out and pressing in, taking this seriously, that because he loves us, he wants to speak to us. I don't want to live with a sparse Shut heaven. I don't want the heavens to be brass over my life. That's not God's will either. But there were times in Scripture when that happened. I got two of them right here. It says in 1 Samuel 3, 1, the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. Now in those days, the word of the Lord was rare and visions were scarce. We don't want that. Amen. We want active, open heaven over our lives. We want to hear the voice of the Lord clearly, know how to discern his voice. He said, my sheep know my voice. A stranger they will not follow. Amos is even more serious. God is speaking, and he says, I will send famine throughout the whole country, and it won't be food or water that's lacking, but my word. Wow. We don't want that. Amen. We don't want that. Pull it down from heaven. Lord, I want to hear your voice. I'm open. I'm not going to be distracted with all the noise and all the news that just is continually trying to be, me to stay addicted to all of that. I want to hear your voice and clearly discern the difference, separate the wheat from the chaff. And, and it goes on to say in Amos that people will drift from one end of the country to the other. They'll go anywhere, listen to anyone, hoping to hear God's word, but they won't hear it. Wow. That's a problem. We don't want that in our time. I believe right now people want to hear the word of God. Amen. They're confused. They realize that the houses they've been building their lives on were on sinking sand because a lot of the things that they were counting on are disappearing. And they're realizing there wasn't any real true foundation. Who do they know? You. They have you in their life. And that's why you need to say, Lord, wake me up in the morning and open my ear as one that's ready to take your orders. That's such a great picture to have that I wake up anxious to hear what the Lord wants to say to me, and then to sustain the weary with a word that you give me. That's what happens. There's life in the prophetic word. All right, we'll go a little further and go into the New Testament in Matthew 3. After this long period from Malachi, there was 400 years that went by with no prophetic word, no active word. 
from the Lord, right? So that's, the, that's that time of silence between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of what we call the New Testament because it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And, and this is the person who broke the silence, John the Baptist. A lot of you probably know this. In Matthew 3, 1, it says it was at that time when the word was scarce, when people were really not operating in, in a lot of faith because the Roman Empire was taking over and, and the Jews were saying, man, if God was in charge, how come we are under this oppressive rule of the Romans? But John the baptizer came and he was preaching in the desert and his message was this, the realm of God's kingdom is about to appear. And what about you? Do you believe that? And I don't believe that means the second coming. I believe the power of God in operation is about to show itself strong on our behalf. So if that realm is about to appear, you better keep turning away from evil, John was saying, and turn back to God. And then it points back to the Old Testament here. And, and this is the Lord saying, Isaiah was referring to John. Wow. Wouldn't that be cool? If you could look in the Old Testament and see your name and know that that Old Testament prophet Isaiah was talking about you. And that's what Jesus is saying. Isaiah was referring to John when Isaiah prophesied a thunderous voice. One will be crying out in the wilderness, prepare yourself for the Lord's coming and level a straight path inside your hearts for him. I think that's for us today. I really do, because there's a battle going on. If you're laid off from work and you've got a lot of free time on your hands, you have to wake up anxious to hear the word of God because your, your flesh is going to try to get you to think about all the worries. And, and the Lord is saying, no, prepare yourself. Make a straight way for the Lord's coming in your heart. And then Jesus went on in chapter 10 to say, don't be intimidated. All right? So the whole purpose of, of, of what I'm trying to show you is for in, in tonight's message about waking me up and, and giving me a word for the weary. I think part of the weariness that we're feeling as the body of Christ is that we really miss each other and we miss being together and we miss that connection because the Bible tells us don't forsake the assembling together for a reason because there's power when we join together. There's power and when we don't have that, we feel like we're lacking a little power and we also start to drift. So all the more now, we dig in, and that's why Jesus said, don't be intimidated. Eventually, everything is going to be out in the open. All of the spiritual warfare that's going on now is going to be exposed, and everyone will know how things are going. So don't hesitate to go public now, <laughs> right? Don't hide. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. That's what Paul said. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation for everyone that believes, and then verse 28, Jesus is talking. He said, don't be bluffed into silence by the threats of bullies. There's nothing they can do to your soul, your core being. Save your fear for God. I mean, save your respect for God and say, Lord, I know I'm here for a reason. Five years from now, when this thing is long past us, I don't want to say, man, what an opportunity I would have had to be sharing with my family. We had a call today in our men's ministry and one of the men has been doing a Zoom call with his family. And every one of those people that's been on this Zoom call, he said, has said the sinner's prayer since they got this Zoom call started. That's taken something bad that's happened, this COVID virus, and turning it into salvation and life for people. What about us? Are we doing that? Do we have that on our mind to say, I'm going to use this example of the devil trying to show his power to show people that God's power is greater and more real. And then verse 32 says, stand up for me. Jesus is talking to us. And he's saying, stand up for me against the world opinion, and I'll stand up for you before my Father in heaven. So don't be backing down right now. If you're talking to people that are hurting, if he's waking you up in the morning and giving you a word for the weary, that's going to sustain somebody. Don't back down from the intimidation of the enemy. This could be the greatest time to talk to people because they're wondering about their, their belief system and they're wondering what do they really believe in because a lot of the things that we were counting on, they're saying, don't seem to be reliable, but Jesus Christ is reliable. Amen. All right, so a little bit more. 
Because I don't, I don't think it's any different really for John the Baptist than we are because he was the voice of one crying in the wilderness. We, we face that a lot too. The difference is that he was still really technically part of the Old Testament because he was an Old Testament prophet. And Jesus said that John was the greatest prophet, but anybody who's in the kingdom that he talked about is greater than him. Because we now have God's presence living inside of us. We're filled with his Holy Spirit. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a portion of scripture that I'll, I'll give my opinion on this. I've heard a couple of different ways that it's taught. But it says when John the Baptist was put in jail, that he sent his followers, the people that were part of John's ministry. Uh, I'll read it. Matthew 11, verse 2 says, John, meanwhile, had been locked up in prison. And when he got wind of what Jesus was doing, he sent his own disciples to ask, are you the one that we've been expecting or are we still waiting? And if I ask you to raise your hand and you were here, a lot of you would have heard preaching on this, I'm sure. And one way to look at it is to say that John was in prison and he was really getting discouraged and he was down and he started to doubt whether Jesus really was the one. I don't believe that, okay? I'm just going to give you a second opinion on that. First of all, they were cousins, okay? So when Elizabeth was pregnant, her cousin, John's mother, was also pregnant. Her name was Elizabeth. And it says when Mary came in pregnant, John the Baptist leapt inside of his mother's womb when, before he was even born. There was an activated spirit in, in John the Baptist. He was courageous, this man. He, the reason he was in jail is because he was calling out sin, one of the leaders, and, and he wasn't afraid of that. So it's really hard for me to believe that in prison, now all of a sudden, he's going to lose that confidence and doubt that Jesus really was the one. He's the one that said after the baptism, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So John had this great revelation. So then you might say, well, then how do you explain this? Why did he send his disciples? Maybe they were the ones that were getting discouraged. Maybe they were coming to visit John, and they're saying, why are you in prison? If, if Jesus is really the one, why would he let something bad happen to you? And, and he said, you know, why don't you just go see him? <laughs> if you're wondering about this, why don't you just go see him? Because I don't think he was doubting at all. He, he was not the kind of guy that was going to back down. All right, so I'll just leave that with you. Because when they did get there, this is what Jesus said to them in verse 4. Go back and tell John what's going on. The blind see, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the wretched of the earth learn that God is on their side. That's called the kingdom of God in the earth. That's called a very present help in time of trouble. It's exactly what was written in the Old Testament about what would happen when God visited his people. He would overtake the powers of darkness that have ruled the earth, and it was happening right in front of their eyes. So if it was his disciples that were having second thoughts, I have a feeling seeing Jesus and probably seeing some of these miracles, tell them, go back and tell John what you've seen. Amen. <laughs> this is what's going on. The blind see, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. Boy, that's a big five right there, but I love the last one. The wretched of the earth learn that God is on their side. Amen. That is good news Amen. that a lot of people don't realize. They think he's angry. They think he's mad at them. They think he's a punishing God if he even does exist. Why do all these bad things happen? Because they're blaming God for things that the devil does. They don't have a clear understanding of the word, why the devil wants to try to confuse people about this, but Jesus was crystal clear about it. This is evidence that God is visiting his people. And then uh, I love the voice translation as well. It says, and uh, I kind of alluded to this already in Matthew 11, no one who has ever been born to a woman is greater than John the Baptist. That's what Jesus said. No one who's ever been born to a woman is greater than John the Baptist. Jesus is excluding himself there because he really, God the Father was his father. So even though he was born of a woman, he had uh, God as his father. And yet, Jesus said, as great as John is, nobody's been greater before him. 
But the most insignificant person in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he is. That means the kingdom here in the earth, God's kingdom here in the earth, you might see yourself as insignificant, but if you're a Christian and you're part of God's kingdom in the earth, you're more powerful, Jesus is saying, than John the Baptist, who was the greatest. There's one difference, the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit of God living in you as a Christian. What you're doing with his presence in you is up to you. Are you cultivating that relationship? Are you spending time with him? Are you telling him, I really want to hear your voice? I'm willing to turn away from some of these destructive habits that I've had. I need your help. I can't do this in my own strength, God. I need your help. Well, he put his spirit right inside you for that reason. And then verse 12 says, all of the prophets of old and all of the law, that was all prophecy leading to the coming of John. That's Jesus talking. When John the Baptist came, the kingdom of heaven began to break in upon us. And those in power are trying to clamp down on it because the people in power are threatened by Jesus. And that's the same thing today. If you read Psalm 2, it says, Why do the heathen rage and the people plot a vain thing against God and against his anointed one? Because those, those spirits of wickedness that try to govern this earth realm have to bow their knee to the lordship of Jesus. The Bible says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, not the Lord of this earth, who we know Satan identified himself that way, right, in the New Testament. He's the father of lies. We serve the one who's the way, the truth, and the life. I'm going to do it on time. I've got a little bit more time here. So I'm going to keep going. All right, it says, when John the Baptist came, the kingdom of heaven began to break in upon us, and those in power tried to clamp down on it. John is the Elijah the prophet we were promised would come and prepare the way. Amen. That's pretty powerful. Amen. But if we're greater than John the Baptist, you have to start thinking about yourself in a better light because the one who's the most insignificant in God's kingdom now, that the, the, the presence of God, the resurrected power of Jesus is in the earth, is even greater than him. He released that prophecy gift, that ability of Elijah to be able to hear the Lord for each one of us. All of us should be hearing the voice of God. He loves us. He's a good father. He wants to speak to us. And I want to wake up in the morning and have him speak to me so that I can give a word that will sustain the weary people. And there's many of them. And it also sustains us where we're feeling weary. Excuse me. I said, John is the Elijah. The prophet we were promised would come and prepare the way. And in case you don't know that reference, that's the last part of the Old Testament. The last verses in Malachi are Malachi 4, 5, and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. All right, this is Malachi the prophet, the last portion of Scripture before we get to the New Testament. I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. That is a powerful statement. What a beautiful picture of what Jesus did. And talk about the Father and the Son and then connecting us and allowing us to be adopted into God's family. Don't live under that spirit of that orphan spirit in this world of the devil. No, come in under the adoption spirit and let the Lord turn your heart to the Father but also to your earthly father. We had that confession. I think I might have mentioned that once already. During this COVID crisis, one of our folks lost their father, and they didn't really even think it was directly related to the COVID crisis. He, was, he had been sick prior to this, but, but it was still a loss, and, and it was difficult because of right now, people just aren't getting closure because they're not allowed to visit people, and then they don't have the normal conditions of the funeral, and the, what we would say is a celebration of people's lives at the funeral, and and they're being denied that ability to do that. And you don't get that same amount of closure. And, and they just said to me, I'm so grateful for all of the teaching that we've had at King of Kings through this Possessing Your Vessel class that kept encouraging us to go back and get our relationships right with our parents and to honor our parents. Because that's, that's right out of the word in Old and New Testament. One of the Ten Commandments is honor your mother and father. 
But Paul reminds us in the New Testament that it's the first commandment with a promise. Honor your mother and father that life may go well with you. Implying that if you're not honoring your mother and father in those areas, life will not go well for you. And in this lady's case, she said, that was the catalyst for me to reach out and get right with my father. And I'm so glad that happened before he died, because I would have been living with a lot more regret right now. But we made it right between us before he left. So this is a beautiful promise. The Lord is going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to their fathers. That's in the natural, but that's also in the spiritual realm and in the dynamic of letting people know that they can come into God's family. He's not an angry judge. He's a loving father. If you don't know the Lord, you can probably have a hard time picturing him as a loving father, but that's exactly who he calls himself, and that we can cry out to him and say, Daddy, the way you would with a loving father, not the angry God that many people picture. So just winding it up now, it's just Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 says, Jesus went through many towns and villages. He taught in the synagogues. He preached the good news of the kingdom of God, all right? That's what we're supposed to be living in today, the good news that the kingdom of God is available to us. I quoted it earlier. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in you. That means that we have tasted of the powers of the age to come, and we're supposed to be operating in them. If Jesus could go say to John the Baptist's disciples, go tell them what you're seeing. Lame people are walking. The dead are being raised. The blind eyes are being opened. The deaf ears are being opened. The lepers are being cleansed. That's the kingdom of God in operation in the earth. We can believe for that. We can have the faith to say those things are happening today too because they are. We have to have the faith to believe it. He healed, verse 35 says, he healed every disease and sickness. Whenever crowds came to him, he had compassion for them because they were so deeply distraught malaised, and heartbroken. That describes today, too. People who are deeply distraught, malaised, and heartbroken. Well, we have good news, right? doesn't mean that they're not going through a tough time. But, but God has given Christians tools to be able to defend themselves against those tough times. It doesn't mean we don't go through tough times. We still have emotions and feelings, but he supports us through a supernatural power that's residing in us. I talked about it earlier, that comfort. It's, it's, it's a peace that passes any natural understanding. It's a supernatural peace. They seem to him like lost sheep without a shepherd. And I think that's also true of a lot of people today that just don't know what they believe, and they need to hear good news. And verse 37 says, Jesus understood what an awesome task was before him. So this is what he said to the disciples. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send more workers into his field. You don't need a lot of credentials to qualify as one of Jesus' workers, okay? I'm just going to say it again. You just want to have this idea in the morning that, Lord, wake me up so that I can hear your voice in my life. I want to know what you're saying to me. Open my ears to listen. I want to be like a person who's ready to receive my marching orders for today. I want a word that will sustain the weary. And I, man, I love that last part. It said, Yahweh empowers me with holy determination. I will do his will and will not be ashamed. So what about you? Are you one of the workers that's going to be in the fields? Ask the Lord of the harvest to send more workers into his harvest field. I don't think in my lifetime there's ever been more pain in people's world where they need an answer that they don't know about. And what are we doing about it? Let's be people that are giving them good news amongst, amidst the bad news that they're experiencing. In John chapter 1, in the voice it says, He, Jesus, entered into our world, a world that he made... And yet the world didn't recognize him. Even though he came to his own people, they refused to listen and receive him. But for all who did receive him and trusted him, he gave them the right to be reborn as children of God. Wow, that's a mouthful. <laughs> he loved us so much that he even 
took the rejection of his own people. Instead of what we would have said, copping an attitude towards them and saying, well, too bad for you. No, he didn't. He said, okay, if you reject me, I'll, I'm making my promise available to whoever wants to come to me. For all who did receive him and trust in him, he gave them the right to be reborn as children of God. So we're born once in the natural realm, and then we're born again into the supernatural realm as children of God, filled with this Holy Spirit, and saying, you know what, Lord, I'm going to choose to make this the rule book of my life. And even though I may not understand every single word of it when I first read it, I'm going to dig in, and I'm going to be a diligent seeker after you. I want to find out what your will is for my life. And boy, I'll tell you what, you talk to somebody who's known the Lord for any length of time, and he will tell you that he met them right where they were when they said that prayer and they said, come into my life, God. He met them right where they are, were at that moment of pain. And then it just keeps getting better. You just keep understanding more and more dimensions of God's nature and you take on more and more of his character and he keeps transforming you into his image if you're willing to let him do that. So then it goes on to say in John 1, 13, he bestowed a birthright not by human power, but by God's will. So he's saying, you were born once in the natural to your earthly parents. Now you can be reborn a second time into heavenly father's house, into heavenly father's family, not of the flesh, but of God's will. Verse 14, the voice, God, took on flesh, Jesus, and became human, chose to live alongside us. We've seen him enveloped. This is the voice version that I really like. We've seen him enveloped in undeniable splendor. The one true son of the father, evidenced in perfect balance of grace and truth. Amen. Whew. Amen. So, look, um, I said it earlier that um, I've, I've been talking to a lot of people during this last five, six, seven, whatever it is, seven weeks now, that we've been under this lockdown and this COVID issue. And... We really are missing each other, and that's, that's not a good thing, but it's a good sign to let us know how important the body of Christ is, Amen. and that when, the, when we don't gather together, we're missing that piece of that encouragement that that other person brings to you, and the beautiful thing about the body of Christ is that, and I'll, I'll teach on it another time, but how it, God talks about it as, as if it was a human body and all the different body parts. And the parts that look insignificant are just as important as the parts that look significant, right? Every person counts to God. And when we come together and we worship together, there's a magnification process that happens. So one, God loves it when one person is worshiping him. But when we come together and we worship, there's a magnification process that happens. One puts 1,000 to flight, but two put 10,000 to flight. So that's part of what we're missing. And I'm just trying to help you identify if you've been having some emotional issues. That's what we miss. So stay connected the way you can. Do Zoom calls. Do phone calls. As, as the rules start to loosen up, get out and be seeing people and, and get with them because it's really important to our makeup. The devil wants to isolate people. That's what we do to punish people in prison is we put them in isolation. So fight it. Don't just sit back and take it fight that thing and say, no, that's not God's will. This whole thing is not God's will. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, more about this on Sunday. It says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22, it says, let us draw near. Okay, and that's the same word for worship in the Bible. Okay, so we sang that song tonight, draw me close to you, never let me go. What a great picture. Draw me close to you, never let me go. I lay it all down again to hear you say that I'm your friend. <laughs> what a powerful verse that is, huh? So I'm, I'm coming to you, Lord. I, verse 22 says, let us draw near. That means worship God. You're coming into his presence and you're saying, Lord, I want to be one with you the way we said with communion tonight. We broke open that piece of bread to remind ourselves that our flesh has to be broken, that our natural will is not going to line up with God's perfect will. If we let it, we have to let the spirit man rule, right? If we sow to the flesh, we reap corruption and sin. If we sow to the spirit, we reap life. So we break that piece of bread and remind ourselves, this is not going to win. The spirit of God is going to win. 
and that he identified with that weakness of our brokenness. I'm drawing near in worship to God. And then it says, with a sincere heart. So I draw near to God with a sincere heart, admitting that I'm not perfect, admitting that I'm a flawed person, and still accepting the fact that he still loves me even with my flaws. It's pretty amazing, but it's true. You don't have to qualify. You just have to, you have to come to him with a heart that says, I want to change. I don't want to be victim of my flesh ruling me. I want the spirit of God in me to be the one that's ruling. And that's that full assurance of faith. So let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith. We should hold fast to the confession of our hope, unwavering. Mm. When, you're, when you're standing on a rock, you don't waver, right? And that's what Jesus told us to do. Watch out for any part of your life that's built on sinking sand because when the storm comes, that's going to be blown away. And then the storms come, and, and people are getting rocked and for legitimate reasons. Businesses are shut down for longer than they ever thought they would be. People are unsure about their economic situation, their jobs. So you have to be able to take an offensive against that attack against you and say, no, I trust God. I'm drawn near to him with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith. I'm not wavering. I'm going to hold fast to the confession of my hope without wavering because my feet are on the rock. And then it says, for the one having promised this is faithful. So you trust Jesus Christ and say, faithful you are, Lord. All your promises are yes and amen. I know, we say it, I know the thoughts and plans you have for me. They're good plans, plans to prosper, plans for abundance in this earth. And then it says in verse 24, we should think towards stirring up one another, okay? That's such a powerful word. We should think about how we can spur one another on, it says in another translation. You know what a spur is, right? That's what the cowboy uses on the back of his boot. When he wants to get the horse to go, he spurs the horse and you feel a jolt. And that might be what your friends need right now. You'll, you'll get a word. The Lord will put somebody on your heart and you'll pick up the phone and you'll call them and, and they'll be like, wow, Man, that's exactly what I needed to hear. Thank you so much for calling me. Because God loves them. And he wants to work through us. So I like the way it says it here too. We should think towards stirring one another up to love and to good works. And then not forsaking the assembling together of ourselves. Okay, so we're not legally allowed to for some more certain amount of time. But hopefully that will be over soon. But that doesn't mean that we can't stay assembled as a body, right? I heard a preacher talk about Christmas time and you have to build a bicycle and you bought the toy and you're trying to read the instructions. You're assembling that bike. And not all of us are too good at that. Me, it's one of them. And if you thought you did the bike right and you had 10 parts left over, you didn't assemble it right. And that thing, your kid's not gonna be safe on that bike, right? And the, the body has to be assembled very similarly. Like every part counts. Not one part is more important than the other. He clearly tells us that. Every person has a place in the body of Christ. And that's why we really need to be very proactive and reach out to people now, especially now, but always. And if you are feeling a little blue about not being together, do something about it. Make calls. Figure out the Zoom calls. It's easy. It's free. All you need is an internet connection, and you can see people's faces on, on that screen, and it's really powerful. Um, we're really getting good at Zoom calls. So I just want to pray for those of you that um, might be feeling a little lonely right now, and um, I believe that the word that he dropped in my heart, which is ready to take orders, that somebody that's weary right now needs to be sustained by a word from God. So if that's you, I just, I'm going to stretch my hand out and just say, be sustained by the word of God right now. It's like food. Jesus said he was the bread of life. He said he was living water. And, and if you're getting weary, he wants to sustain you. And, and I believe he was thinking about you when he talked about this verse in Isaiah, that the body of Christ is here to support one another. We need one another. We're not assembled if we're out by our, ourselves and lonesome. We have to be connected in to a body. 
and God wants you. He accepts you. You don't have to qualify and hand in a resume and hope they call you back and say you're hired. No. If you come to him with an open heart, he accepts you for who you are, just as you are. He doesn't want you to stay in that place because he wants you to grow. Just like you don't want your children to stay infants, right? You want them to grow. He'll nourish you. But the beautiful thing is the body of Christ will also nourish you too. And we help each other because we're all his children. But really when he says the body of Christ, we are his body in the earth. So when we connect with each other the way we do when we meet in church, we're supporting one another. And, we're, and it's very life-giving. It's a life-giving relationship. Now, every time we've been meeting lately, we've just been saying a prayer at the end, just in case somebody's watching that isn't normally part of a, of a church service or a body and somebody invited you to come and you don't know too much about this. So we just want to say a prayer. If, if your, your heart is open to this idea and you're hearing something that's stirring you on the inside, that you're feeling something that's different and that the word of God could be true, God is inviting you and saying, come into my family. He's like, it's knocking on the door, but you have to open it up on the inside and invite him in. It's a voluntary thing. He won't force himself on you. And that's what the word says, that if you believe it in your heart and you confess it with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, that you will be saved. So we're just going to say a prayer. And we'll say it out loud. The people that are here will say it out loud together. And, and by saying that prayer, you're inviting the Lord in. And then he'll do the work from there. He'll make himself real to you. But one of the things you have to do is just grab hold of the Bible. And you don't even need a physical book anymore. You can get the Bible right online for free a lot of different ways. But you got to get yourself in the book. You have to understand. Start with the Gospel of John and the New Testament. Book of Acts, those are two good places to start. Gospel of Luke. To just understand how this could apply for you today. You might think, man, that happened 2,000 years ago. How could that matter today? It really does. He's alive. He created the earth. He's relevant to every generation. And he's relevant to us today. So what we're saying when we say this prayer together, you're just inviting the Lord to come in. And so I'm turning from that old lifestyle. I'm turning away from the sin. And I'm coming to you for forgiveness of my sin, Lord. And then the power to overcome sin in my life. Christians still make mistakes. We're not perfect people, but we're forgiven people and we're filled with his presence to try to fight off that sin. And before we knew him, we didn't even know we were supposed to do that. So let's just say this out loud together. If you want to stand, that'd be great. We're going to just say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I heard good news tonight that you're a God who loves me, not wanting to punish me but sending your son to die in my place so that I could be forgiven. I hear you knocking on that door. And I want to open my heart to receive you tonight. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. And I repent for my sin. I receive that forgiveness that Jesus purchased on the cross. And I ask you to fill me with that Holy Spirit, that same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead to make you real in my life and live inside of me. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Fill me with your power to be your child in this life and for eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So if you said that prayer by faith and you believe it in your heart, you are saved. That's what that born again experience that we talked about is about tonight. You were born once into the natural realm. You inherited Adam and Eve's sin. But now that you're born again, you're born into God's kingdom. And now you inherited the forgiveness that Jesus purchased on the cross. We'd love to hear from you if you could reach out to us somehow. Come to our website, send us an email. We'll get your resources and then watch online until we can meet again. However you do it, we want to help you in this process because the body of Christ is here to support one another and it's the best decision that you could ever make. But you'll have an opponent, the enemy, Satan, that's going to want to take it away. Don't let him do it. Dig in and believe 
that this is the best decision that you ever made in your life and make it work for you. So, Lord, I just want to pray for everybody that's watching. I thank you that they were with us tonight. Thank you for the power of your word. It was nourishment to our spirit, man. And I just bless them. As we leave now, we got to go. But I know that you'll be with them as they go. And until we get together again on Sunday, I bless you to have an awesome week in Jesus' name. Love you.